we're so grateful and thankful to be before you again. And God is just such a great God. And he is an awesome God. And the praise team has just finished singing, made a way. And our backs are against the wall and it seems like everything is over. God will continue to make a way. And we're standing here only because he, the God that we serve, made a way. And he keeps on making a way. He'll move anything. Look, it doesn't matter what comes in your way. He'll move mountains. He'll move barricades. He'll move the enemy. He'll move demons. He'll move whatever that needs to be moved. Whatever is in the way, he will move. And just know what we have to do. All we have to do is rest in the Lord. God, thank you. Thank God for the prayer uh, by, Deacon, by Deacon Harris. And just thank God for and all those who are participating in, 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 this, in this service. I want to talk to you today because this is, this is Black History Month. And we've heard over the last year that black lives matter. And we understand that justice should be done. And there's just so many things that we have experienced and we've been experiencing since we've been uh, in these United States and since we've been born in America. And I need us to understand that we are in a fight and we'll always be in a fight. And this being a Black History Month, uh, we want to come before you, hopefully on every Sunday, and have some type of presentation uh, concerning black history. Today I will not be before you long. My goal is to keep everything within our time limit, including um, communion. And so I want you to go ahead and prepare and make sure that you have your communion at home, your crackers and your juice. And here again, we will bless it and we will go through our sacrament and uh, we, will, we will have communion because today is the first Sunday. I want to <clears throat> talk to you about keeping the heritage, the heritage alive, keeping the heritage alive. We have an heritage as a people, as black people, and I want to include both our natural inheritance along with our spiritual inheritance. We must understand that we can't have one without the other. And we want to talk to you about keeping the, the heritage alive, the inheritance, the legacy. We need to keep our legacy, our traditions alive, our customs and our culture alive. And I'm not talking about stuff that's made up and that's cynical and that's out of order and things that God does not approve. I'm talking about all the things that God approves, all the things that God has given us as a people, all the things, the, the, the blessings, the talents, the abilities, the know-how. God has blessed black Americans with so much. And he has blessed us with so much. And you have to understand, the Bible says, to whom... Much is given, much is required. <clears throat> and so we must understand that because of what he has given us and because of what we know, we must continue to keep what God has given us alive. We must continue to keep it alive. We must continue to tell our children and our grandchildren. We must continue to demonstrate. We have got to be strong for our, for, for our next generation. We have got to understand <clears throat> That is God's will and is God's way for us to continue to pour into the next generation. And I'm not necessarily just talking about uh, relatives of our own household. And we are to be there first. We're to do what we need to do concerning them first. But God wants us to continue to pour into our next generation. And you have to understand that when God re reveals truths and facts and he reveals, uh, he gives us illumination and revelation and he reveals principles, and he gives us understanding. All of these things God does for us so that we can, in turn, uh, pour back into somebody else's life. And so, and, and that's what we do. We do here every Sunday and every Wednesday, and I hope you are doing it too, uh, wherever you go and at home and on the telephone and through uh, as you're texting and, and, the, and as you're communicating. I pray that when God is giving you something, blessing you and he's giving you something, something that you understand 
so much so that you can communicate it to somebody else, so much so that when they hear it, that they are able to digest it and understand it in a way to where it changes their life. I heard a saying the other day, and I said a little bit of it last Sunday, and, and, and the saying was, somebody said that it's, it's not our job to try to change the whole world because we cannot, as one individual, we cannot change the whole world. But what we can do as, as, as leaving an inheritance and leaving a legacy and tradition and culture, what we can do is take one individual and change their world. We can change the world of one individual. We can change how they think. We can change how they process. We can change how uh, they interact. We can change how they uh, move in their lives and how they deal with circumstances and problems and issues and how they overcome we can change how they view the world and so i mean view their world and they can have a better life and a better world because of it it is very important we we were discussing uh, myself and one of the deacons we were discussing that when you go into our homes and you look at pictures on the wall we do not see very we don't see that many uh, pictures of our black ancestors. We don't see a picture, you know, I, my dad was born in, in 1903, and so um, I do not know, I have not yet, and I, and I need to do something about it, I do not know, I have not seen my grandfather. But it would be nice to know. And, and so that tells me that grand, my, grand, my, my grandfather was born in, in the 1800s, since my dad was born in 1903. And I don't see a picture of him on the wall. And I don't see a picture of my, I don't have a picture of my dad on the wall. I have a one, two, few pictures of him, a picture of him on a forklift and, and, and some other pictures. But, but I do not have, so, so I don't go in my house and I see my grandfather and my, and my dad who were maybe a, a governor or maybe CEO of a company or maybe had his own business. He was an entrepreneur or he, or, or he invented something or he was, uh, connected to something uh, that has left a legacy and, and left an inheritance and, and left history and enriched the culture in which we now live. I, I, I don't see that, and many of us don't see that. And so somehow, somewhere in this life, as we're growing, we feel disconnected. We feel like there, there, there's no connection, and sometimes and many times we feel like we're having to start all over again. We feel like we don't have anything to build on. We don't have anybody's shoulders to stand on. But we do have somebody's shoulders to stand on. We have the shoulders of Jesus Christ to stand on. But, but in the natural, it seems like we don't have anybody's shoulder to stand on. And so, and, and so knowing all of that and understanding all that, it's time that we tell ourselves when it comes to legacies and inheritance and culture and traditions, it's time to, we're to tell ourselves the buck must stop here. In other words, I must start. I must start in my lifetime uh, leaving a legacy, leaving an inheritance. I must start the things that I understand and the things that God has given me and the abilities and all of this, these skills and talents and moral, con moral uh, character, all of this stuff that God has given me. It's time for me to make sure that I communicate it and make sure that I dump it into somebody else's life right. that's coming behind me so that we can live in a better world, so that we can have a better life. The Bible says over in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, the Bible says that a good man, it starts off saying a good man, a good man, a good, a good man, Whew, a good man. Well, well, what is a good man? A good man is like Jesus was. The Bible says, and Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. A good man is one who does good things. A good man is one who's morally and righteous and, and practice righteousness. A good man is one who's honest and have integrity and have uh, good morals and his morals are stable and, and his morals are that of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's trying to practice what, the, what Jesus Christ told him that he needs to practice. He's trying to die to himself and allow the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the living Christ to live through him. The Bible says a good man does something. What does a good man do? A good man, a good man leaves 
an inheritance. He leaves an inheritance. So we have to understand that a good man leaves something. What does he leave? He leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness. What does he leave? An inheritance. What kind of inheritance? An inheritance of moral, stable, and goodness to who? To his children's children and to his, his grandchildren. And so it behooves us to, when we see not only our own grandchildren, but when we see grandkids, it's important that we pour into them. It's important that we tell them things. It's important that we build them up. It's important that we encourage them. It's important that we tell them who they can be and the things that they should do and should not do. And those of us who are in education, those of us who are in around children every day, I know you see things every day, but I want to encourage you not to focus on the negative, not to focus on what they're not doing, not to focus on their failures, but find something good in them. Find something. Find a little light. If it's just a speck of a light, if it's not a big light, but a small light, find that light and begin to feed them. Begin to tell them who they are and what they can be and how God will even help them overcome even the little bitty ones, the little tiny ones. Start to pour into them and say, baby, you're going to be somebody. You know what? When my son was first born, the, 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 the older people looked at him and said, that boy right there going to be somebody. And thank the Lord, I took, I took, I believed, because you have to understand they're very cute and they're, you're very proud of them. But as they grow, there are some challenges. And if you don't have somebody to plant a seed in your mind and in your spirit about them, you'll feel like you're going to lose them along the way. How many, can, I get a, can I get a witness up in here? But, 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 but God will, will speak to somebody and you can hold on to the fact that they are going to be not just anybody, but somebody. To be somebody. So a good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children. Inheritance means something. In the natural, inheritance means something that is maybe inherited. The act of inheriting or receiving property. The reception of genetics qualities by transmission from parent to offspring. The gaining of a possession, that's, that's receiving an inheritance. The gaining of a possession, condition, or trait from past generations leaves an inheritance. And when I first started looking at this scripture, you know, we've taught it in the past, and we pretty much uh, limit it to money. But inheritance means more than money, man. Inheritance, look, look, we... we See, we, 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 first of all, we need our children and the, and, and the next generation, and, the, and they're here now. We need them to receive uh, our moral inheritance. And that's why we practice, we try to practice living right and talking right and doing right. Because we want to leave them something to see. Because as when we leave this world, when we leave this world, they're going to be here by themselves. And we need them to have seen and experienced moral, stable goodness. We need to, them to exist. See, see, what we don't want to do is we don't want to preach to them all the time. We always preach it to them, always preach it to them. Always. No, we need to practice with them. We need to make sure that we are trying to put forth an effort. And, and this is where we need to put forth an effort. Not when things are going good. We need to make sure we put forth an effort when pro problems come in our lives and hardships come in our lives, that's when we need to man up and woman up and demonstrate Jesus Christ. They need to see us respond and act under pressure. Mm -hmm. they, they, they need to see how we're going to act when we forget to pay a, a light bill and the light bill and the lights got cut off. We got the money, but we just forgot to pay it. And the lights got cut off. They need to see us say, wow, man, all right, we, got to, we got to see what happened here. Oh, I know what happened. I got busy doing this and that and the other and such and such and such and so and so and so. Or so. an emergency came up and so and so. And I need to run on down here and go and get this taken care of so they can come out here and, and do what they need to do and so on and so forth. They don't need to see you ratting and raving and cussing and fussing and threatening folks and talking about, I know they ain't turned my lights out. I don't know who they think. They, well, I, they can't, we don't need to see. They don't need to see all of that. And a lot of times we think because we are parents, we have a right to act like we act because we make the money, we pay the bills, we pay their bills, we, we pay for their clothes, and we, 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 uh, 
We give them food, clothes, and shelter. So, you know, I have a right. We never have a right, never have a right to dishonor God before in front of the next generation. Yes. No. There, there, there is no excuse. And so we must understand that we must learn how to build a scaffold around them as they're growing up. As they are growing up, and I heard this the other day, it makes so much sense. See, we're trying to determine what kind of building our children are going to be. We're trying to determine whether they're going to be a skyscraper mm -hmm. or, 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 or a big conglomerate company or if, if they're going to be a, a, a nice home or, you know, when you talk about structure, if they're going to be a, a, a nice tower. But that's not our job to determine what kind of building they're going to be. Our job, our job is to make sure that we build a scaffold around them. And help them to be whatever it is that they want to be and God has put in them to be. What does a scaffold do? A scaffold, a, a, a scaffold uh, helps to steady and helps to guide and protect and change and encourage and help when they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Got to got to help them when they get in trouble. Got to got 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 to hold them up when they want to fall, when they going the wrong way. We got to correct them, put them back on track. Yeah, you ain't going nowhere because this scaffold is around you. And we got to know how to deal with trouble in their life. We can't crucify them because we want to crucify them one day and raise them up the next day. And we have to we have to be able to determine when to say something and when not to. But we've got to always remember, we've got to remember, always remember the big picture. And the big picture is this, is that we want to leave an inheritance. We want to leave something that they can stand on. Not just the word of God, but the word of God principles. Because, see, they're going to, as they live, they're going to have their own experiences with God anyway. We need to teach them godly principles that they understand so that they can put some thing, have some things in place so when they get to a certain point in their life that God will be able to talk to them. They have certain disciplines in their life that we have imparted to them and demonstrated to them and trained and taught them that they have certain disciplines in their life. So when God begin to come into their life and try to redirect them or change them or get them to be obedient where they should be, that they will have had the natural discipline. So when God comes in to talk to them and change them through his word, that they will gladly submit and that they will repent and that they will move forward. Why? Because we have done what we needed to do. And so Proverbs 13, 20 says, leaving an inheritance of moral, of moral. It says, leaving an inheritance of moral stability. Now the word moral there, moral means honorable and principled. So we've got to make sure that we leave moral, honorable, and principled stabilities and goodness. They need to see stability in us. They need to see consistency in us. They need to see strength. And then it says goodness. They, they need to see us being kind. They need to see us being honest, honesty and integrity. They need to see how we do business. They need to see how we spend our money. They need to see how we save our money. They need to see how we manage our money. They need to see how we manage our relationships. They need to see how we work for individuals, work for companies. They need to see our diligence. They need to see us being kind and helping other people. They need to see us giving to individuals who cannot afford to have certain things. They need to see us being nice and generous, generous and kind and honest. And then we see here that as we move to another scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 because I need you to understand that it's very very important it's very important see God has allowed us to be here and we're always here see you know I heard I heard I heard one writer say it's better to not have lived than to have lived and not know why you were born it's better not to have been born to have been born and live all these years and not even know why 
What a waste. And so God don't, he does not want us to waste. And, 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 and that's why sometimes I know you say, well, these, these young folk, these people not listening. Tell them anyway. You don't know if they listening. These young people are smart. This, this generation is smart. They can hear you, hear somebody else, and still be playing on the game at the same time. Oh, y'all didn't hear that. Y'all didn't hear that. You think, you think they're not paying attention? They, they, can, they can quote back to you exactly word for word what you said, and, and, and it looked like they weren't even paying you no attention at all. They weren't even looking at you when you were talking to them. But they, they, yes, they heard you. They heard you. As a matter of fact, they can tell you how many times you told them at what time and what date. That's how smart they are. But look, but, but look here. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 says, A good name is better than precious perfume. To have a good name, to have a good reputation. When your name, when our name comes up, when granddaddy's name come up, when daddy's name come up, when great granddaddy's name come up, what does everybody say? What does the nation feel? How does the nation feel? How does the community feel? How does the church feel when granddaddy's name come up in the church? Did he help build the church? Did he help keep it together? Was he an example or did he just, just tear up the church? When the name come up, everybody said, woo! <laughs> Says a good name. Now, you know how good, you, you know, you know how, how expensive and good precious perfume is. It, it just, it, it's, nothing, it's nothing like smelling good. Nothing like it. Nothing like a, a good smelling aroma. The Bible says a good name is better than precious perfume. Think of the most expensive perfume or cologne you've ever worn. Your and my good name is better. Yes. So when your name come up, my name come up, your name comes up. You want to make sure that a good reputation is going with it. But look at what it says. It says, and the day of death better than the day of one's birth. Now that right there is kind of an oxymoron, kind of confusing. You're trying to tell me it's better. The day that I die is better than the day that I was born. You lost your mind. Huh? But what is he saying? He, he, he's saying that a good reputation is better than expensive pleasures. And the day someone dies is better than the day they were born. Why? Because of their good reputation. See, see when, by the time that you die, you should have in your lifetime developed good character. You should have left inheritance, a good inheritance, a good legacy. In various areas of your life, you should have taught somebody how to work, somebody how to be honest, somebody how to serve and worship the Lord your God. Oh, wow, wow, wow. You should have been an example to let somebody know and somebody see that you put God first in your life that you didn't slack God, that you used all of your God-given abilities and talents to glorify him and to serve mankind. A good reputation, a good reputation. And so why you, so the days, and so why you were living, why you were living, why you were living, all of this was demonstrated. So the day someone dies is better than the day they were born. Why? Because of their good reputation and their honorable principles. What? Their honorable principles that they leave behind for the next generation. It's a blessing that this man died because we honor the legacy of his life. We celebrate his life. We said the celebrated or the life celebration. We're here celebrating the life of such and such. Why are we celebrating the life? Because of what they gave to mankind. 
they poured themselves out. Some of us, we have parents. Many of us have parents. If you were to really look at them, we have parents that dedicated and sacrificed their life. And that's why we have what we have. And that's why we think like we think. And that's why we hold on to certain traditions and certain cultures. And that's why we have certain stabilities and certain consistencies. And that's why, oh my God, that's why we worship and serve the Lord our God. Because mama and grandmama served him and they drug us to church and they made sure that we were in prayer meetings and they made sure that we were in certain teachings and Bible study not that we wanted to be there but because they said we were going to be there they showed us they demonstrated and they never used excuses they always had a roof over our head we didn't know what they were going through we didn't know how they were feeling we didn't know if they were sick we didn't know if they were without a job all we know is that when we turned on the water it ran when we needed heat it was there when we needed food on the table it was there we don't know about the sacrifice we don't know what they had to go through and what names they were called on the jobs that they worked hard on every day all we know is they came home and they said I'm here and they did what they were supposed to do and then sometimes on weekend they were sacrificed when they wanted to sit down and rest when they wanted to rest from their labors and rest from people treating them and calling them names they took us to different places so that we could enjoy ourselves took us to the fair took us here and there My, my, my. And now they are going on to be with the Lord. And the Bible says the day that they died is better than the day that they were born. Isn't that something? Ah. The day of death is better than the day of one's birth. And so we want to live like that. We want to make sure because of their good reputation and their honorable principles, they leave behind and they left behind the generation. Their values, their moralities, their doctrines, and their main beliefs and standards. And then the Bible says, and in, the, in this next verse, or the part of this next verse, he says, and. So he talks about the good reputation. Talks about it's better when a man's died than when he's born. Then he turns around and go back and talk to the living. It says, and the wealth of the sinner. So just in case you think that you're being slighted because you are serving God and you sacrifice and you don't do what the world does and some jobs you have not taken for more money because it would take you away from your family and take you away from time with God and take you away from serving others like you need to. Just in case you're saying the sacrifice is too great. Just in case you're saying the Lord, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if that's what I really need to do. After all, I've been to college. I've got an education. I've got all these opportunities before me. I just don't know, God, if this is you or the enemy trying to help me or make me miss my blessing. Just in case that stuff comes across you, there is a part A, part B to this scripture. It says, and. And the wealth of the sinner, the wealth of the rich folk, the rich folk that ain't thinking about God, that don't care about him. They out there building streets and houses and buildings and companies and communities. The Bible said, hold on, don't worry, do what you're supposed to do. Be honorable, be in, have integrity, make sure that you have more stability and goodness because the wealth of the wicked, the wealth of the sinner, finds its way eventually to my house, into my hands. Take that, devil. You're working for me right now, and you don't even know it. You're building a house for me, and you don't even know it. You stir it up. Look, look, you, you over there getting a promotion. You, you in the office, you in the meeting, carried on something furious because you want your position to make more money all to find out that you won't be there long. I'm coming in to take that. Thank you so much for fighting for me. 
And so we must understand that the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up for in the first place. I want us to make sure and understand that it is important that as we move through this month, we're going to bring forth and remind you that we must, we must keep the dream alive. We've got to keep hope alive. We've got to make sure that we continue to do what we need to do. Do you understand that one of the reasons why we're here is because of Jesus? Jesus understood that we were going to have an inheritance. Do you understand that Jesus had to die on that cross so that we could have an inheritance? Do you realize that had he not died, that we would have a bleak, obscure, not, nothing to look forward to inheritance? But because he died on the cross, gave his life, was beaten, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, shed blood out on Calvary's cross, that you and I can have a right to the tree of life, an inheritance to eternal life. Hallelujah. As you stand to your feet, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for thinking about us. We had no inheritance, no connection. We were sinners gone astray. Not fit to live, not fit to die. But through your grace and mercy, you loved us first. Yes, yes, you saw us from the beginning. Yes. Went ahead and died. Thank you. Rose again. And you told us, don't forget what you did. So we always have this communion and this sacrament to remind ourselves, to remind this flesh when it gets out of order what your son Jesus did for us. So the Bible says that as they were in the upper room, Jesus was sitting down with his disciples and he broke the bread and he told them to take and eat all of it. This is my body which was broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup saying, I died, I'm going to die. There's going to be some bloodshed because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. You still won't be fit for the kingdom. So I'm going to die and I'm going to shed blood because that's the only way God has to see the blood in order for your sins to be forgiven. And so he took the cup and said, drink. It's the New Testament in my blood. Drink all of it. And he reminded them, he said, as often as you eat this cup, eat this bread and drink of this cup, you demonstrate and you remind yourself of my death and resurrection until I come back. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the inheritance. Thank you for the legacy of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for the culture of the, the culture, hallelujah, of the kingdom. And God, we thank you that we're not of this world. We're in this world, but not of it. We are of another world. We are of another generation, an eternal kingdom, an eternal family. Bind us together with tender love and mercy and understanding and commitment. And to all those that are committed to you, continue to bless them and keep them. And we thank you and we praise you. Now as we leave this place, bring us back on the appointed time. And we'll be careful to praise you and give you all, all honor and glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.